Um, so this is uh, my final bit, uh, and not everybody has a media lab, but I think all of us can be curators, whether you're uh, you know, a thyroid specialist or a nosebleed specialist, or you suffer from thyroid problems, or, or, or stamp collecting, whatever your thing is. Um, and um, you know, back in 2010, we were just creating, now there's so much stuff out there uh, that in some ways the curators are, are taking over a bit. And, uh, and they're, they're thoughtfully putting these things together. This is an example of what I would do in my clinic. So after I, you know, I have a website and after I see patients, I just load up, uh, oh, I don't have anything on atrial fibrillation or I don't, this is on, I can't remember, mental health, depression. And so I just drive people uh, to the site just to, uh, I just curate that for my patients. And uh, uh, so this has become a big area. So I just want to show you another one. This also is about end of life. So it sounds depressing, but it's not actually. This guy, uh, and I'm not suggesting that all of us or all our patients could, could be this uh, incredible at reframing end of life, but I don't know how well you kind of do end of life stuff here, but it's, it's not very well done in Canada. So uh, this is part of a series we're doing, and this was the, um, the group in England. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's an example of curation where I send this to my patients uh, at this stage of life just to get them to kind of tweak. So I'll just play it. In six weeks' time, I will be dead. I will be cremated. I will face huge fear. But it is an extraordinary experience. This is the most exciting and the most extraordinary journey of my life. My only regret is it ends. I'd like to be on this journey with you almost forever and a day. I was asked to shoot an intimate portrait of a man that I didn't know. I knew that he was very ill, but I really wasn't sure what to expect. It's only when they say, you know, Philip Gould, you're going to die, get used to it, and this is going to happen in weeks or months. It's only when that happens you're aware of death, and only when that happens also that suddenly life screams at you in its intensity. I saw my children born, I saw them born, and I saw the incredible, massive potential of that moment. And when my father died, and the air left his body, it was as powerful as the air entering the body of my, uh, my daughters. And I knew that the purpose here now was to give as much love as I could two people who mattered to me, even though I was dying. And my life became death. It gained a kind of quality and a power it had never had before. It entered a new zone, which was the death zone. Oh, sorry, it's my wife. Just one second. Hi, darling. Yeah, you okay with all this then, darling? It's lovely, I feel good, it's gonna be beautiful there, I'm gonna love it. After an intense, intimate discussion, Philip and I decided to shoot his portrait at Highgate Cemetery on his own grave. Only when you accept death can you free yourself from it, can you deal with it, can you move forward from it. So acceptance is the absolute key. At that moment, you gain freedom, and you gain power, and you gain courage. This is it. This is going to be, you know, my home for eternity. I do really feel, in my mind, I've reframed it. I've changed it. It's not some gloomy, ghastly thing. It's this, I just think this is such a wonderful, wonderful idea, the community of the living, uh, and the dead, and I, 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 I have no fear at all about going to this. It's great. I'm happy about it. I feel a sense, actually, almost of optimism about it, of almost looking forward to it as the next stage, and certainly very, very comfortable. You sort of think, God, I'm scared, I'm a coward. I thought I was a coward. I was the kind of guy who was too frightened to kind of go too fast on a bike in the evening time. You think, I can't do this, I can't do chemotherapy. It's too painful, it's too horrible. But you do it. And then they say, by the way, mate, 
You're not going to have a stomach. Because you'll never eat normally again, ever again. And you kind of get used to it. And then you sort of think, actually, every single thing they throw at you is handleable. You can do it. I have my wife and my children there for me at this moment because I am defining myself now through death. I'm giving meaning to myself through death. Without that, I do not know what I would do. I rely upon them enormously, almost completely. I try and lead them. I try and inspire them. I try and show strength. I had a couple of really tough nights. My breathing was bad. My coughing was bad. Everything was bad. And Gail was in a bad state too. And then I just lay there and thought, okay, this is bad, but this is death. And as long as I look death in the eye, and as long as I accept that I can choose the death that I seek and the death that I choose, I have some freedom here. I have some power here. I have some possibility to shape for myself my own death. And at that moment, I have a kind of freedom. I've had more moments of happiness in the last five months than perhaps the last few years. More moments of a kind of private ecstasy uh, than really for many years, when I just feel at one with the world. The thing I'd like to say to my daughters is, I love them. And the thing I'd, say to, I'd like to say to my wife is, I'm sorry I let you down, but my God, you're fantastic. And I'm not letting you down now. And you will have the best life afterwards, I believe. I love them all. That's what I want to say to them. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> Incredible, eh? I always think of the data, you know, uh, when people go into good palliative care programs, they actually live longer, <laughs> which is counterintuitive. And I, I think he's a good example. They've, they've come to peace with where they're at. So, um, so I'm always getting this question, you know, on my Facebook page, if a patient uh, friends me on Facebook, should I say yes? And my answer is pretty obvious, no. I don't want my patients seeing my latest. So this is my, uh, the one on the left is uh, my, uh, my kind of professional, what they call Facebook fan page, which you can set up in like five seconds. And you can just load your stuff on there. If you've got a new you know, flu shot thing for pregnant mums, you can load it on there. You can put on when your clinic's closed. You're, you're, there can be conversations if you want. Uh, whereas on the right is my uh, personal Facebook page, which I kind of keep separate. This is my daughter on the left and my niece on the right. My daughter was in France all summer and um, I'm one of those people, I guess sort of the waspy thing. I, I, when, I, when I left home, I didn't ever really talk to my parents. That, like I kind of, I feel like when, with my kids, I should just let them rip, you know, like I shouldn't be in contact with them. And so my daughter took that to kind of an extreme this summer. So she only texted me once. She calls me homie on text messages. And she goes, the one thing she texted me, she goes, homie, what are the three digits on the back of your visa card? That was it, all summer. Um, anyways, uh, so the point there is, uh, is that if you start to build stuff and you start to curate things, uh, you can actually uh, just build something for your patients very easy. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, Facebook will uh, tell you all your data. So we did a thing on what's the best drink, and uh, it had nine, 8,000 uh, uh, reach that week. And I've never done this, but you know, this is how Facebook makes money, is you can pay them to boost your posts and send it to a, a wider audience. So. Um, so this is my second last slide. So just to say some of the projects we're doing, we're doing a big thing on uh, kids' nutrition and nutrition in general. Uh, we're taking uh, 23 and a half hours and we're embedding it with uh, uh, kind of data visualization. Everybody's wearing Fitbits or uh, I watches and we're gathering all their data and dropping in a whole bunch of kind of behavioral bombs. Uh, quite a, a bit of sort of nudges, more organizationally based with uh, 
rewards. Rewards are interesting. Um, j just getting people to move a little bit doesn't seem to work uh, too far. Make your day harder. We're making that into a campaign actually June 11th where you make your day harder and you take a picture uh, of you parking farther away or taking the stairs or whatever it is. So please join us. Uh, Beer League Doctor, the, the tagline on that is a doctor in a locker room answering questions. Uh, so it's very funny. And, uh, and then we're, we're doing something called the Better Life Experiment. So just focusing on uh, eating better, sleeping better, um, moving more, uh, better social capital, so better relationships, and then thinking better. Uh, and uh, I think these things get siloed a bit. So uh, we're launching that with the YMCA. Um, so I guess my final slide, don't let what you can't do prevent you from what you can do. I'm a perfect example of that, of just little, little moves. Um, and, and in some ways, this is the exact same advice I, I give a patient around their, their own kind of change. But uh, focusing a little bit more on, on small changes, um, uh, this concept you know, around our own kind of behaviors, we think it's willpower. And I think in, when we're trying to construct better programs, we just think it's better, better thinking. Um, I think a lot of it's around choice architecture and uh, my sort of MO for changing clinician behavior is how can we make it easier to do the right thing.